Hi, this is Kelsey Fikowski, and in this video, we are going to review for the exam in just 15 minutes. Please note that this is not meant to be an exhaustive review, but it highlights some of the major points of this uh, particular course. So let's get into the format, 55 multiple choice questions, and then you have your four FRQs. In terms of the first three FRQs, the concept application, you will be asked to basically take some type of concept you've learned and apply it to a scenario as you see right here. In FRQ number two, the quantitative, referring to interpreting data, it might be in a chart, it could be an infographic, and you have to basically explain the data using the concepts and the information you've learned from AP Gov. And then this is where the SCOTUS comparison, the Supreme Court cases, where they're going to give you a background on a case that you've never heard about, and you have to compare or contrast it to one of the foundational uh, civil rights cases or Supreme Court cases that you've studied and uh, compare and contrast. So really understanding the clauses and the background of those cases is a must. Now here with FRQ4, this is where you're going to have a uh, specific argument that needs to be developed and you have to come up with an argument with a line of reasoning. You cannot just say uh, that, for example, the pluralist theory is the best example because of Brutus 1 and Federalist 10. You want to avoid document dumping and instead have a clear line of reasoning, all right? So here is a graphic that may be helpful to you in terms of how to approach this. Again, uh, have some type of line of reasoning and then the evidence coming from the foundational documents and other uh, information that you've studied here. Not to mention as well the opposing viewpoint. I do have an FRQ uh, number four argumentative essay video on my YouTube channel if you are interested. You should also be very familiar with these foundational documents as they will appear in multiple choice format as well as the FRQ4 argumented essay. So again, just know the main concepts as listed here. Feel free to pause as needed. And then in a similar fashion with the court cases, these are very, very important. So for example, uh, you don't need to know every nitty gritty detail, but for, for example, US v. Lopez, Know that this decreases the power of the national government thanks to gun-free school zones. That was the major topic here um, in with respect to federalism and specifically the clause of the Commerce Clause. The federal government going a little bit too far with that over uh, the, the use of the, the states to do their own thing. Now, in terms of the court cases as well, just be familiar that when we deal with this process of known as selective incorporation, where you would nationalize each aspect of the Bill of Rights, the only two major cases that we're going to be discussing from that list, McDonald, uh, which is going to nationalize the Second Amendment through the Due Process Clause, and Gideon v. Wainwright, nationalizing that aspect through the uh, Due Process Clause. So just, again, keep that in mind. And then, of course, we have the Brown v. Board of Education, which always appears in some form or another. Uh, in terms of the amendments, I've listed the ones that you should be familiar with. Um, you note that I did not put the 27th or the Third Amendment, but I would really have some semblance as to what these amendments are about. There are some easy tricks to memorize them uh, and to be familiar with them, and those are also located on my YouTube channel as well. So let's get into it. When we look at the origins of the Constitution, right, it first starts with America's first Constitution. That's the Articles of Confederation. They are weak. Too much power is given to the states. National government doesn't even have a court system. It does not have a president, and it has no power to tax. And this comes to light with Shay's Rebellion exposing the weaknesses of the Articles of Confederation. And this is going to lead to the development of the new Constitution. Uh, remember, there are many compromises brokered where you have the Virginia plan, you have the New Jersey plan, and we're going to merge the best aspects of those into the Great Compromise three-fifths compromise dealing with slavery. And then, of course, even the Electoral College is considered a uh, compromise because states have a part in the system of electing the president and also being able to uh, come up with voter requirements. A key finding here of the U.S. Constitution, you know, really uh, holding up, unlike the Articles of Confederation, is, of course, the Whiskey Rebellion. So in Unit 1, big ideas here, really the scope of the national government versus the state. Um, and the states, the local small states, are really not going to ratify this new constitution until a Bill of Rights. The first 10 amendments are going to be provided. These are protections against the fears of a strong national government. Also, the 10th Amendment is huge because this gives a state states some say here thanks to federalism right not all the power is given to the national government states do have some role here and some very fundamental cases here mcculloch v maryland very important early on in establishing the strength of the national government over the states but at the same time when we studied us v lopez this gives some of the states some power saying hey national government you're going a little too far with commerce clause for example so prior to fdr prior to the 1930s we had what was called dual federalism think dual two where the national government did its thing the state's government did its thing. Uh, there was really not much overlap. 
After FDR and the Great Depression, we have what's called cooperative federalism. Think about cooperating, they're working together. And that's really the def definition of federalism that we're in today with respect to fiscal federalism, where the federal government interacts with the states primarily through money, the grant system, with block versus categorical uh, grants, for example. So take a moment to pause right here, because I'm going to reveal the answer in just a second. But what concept does this highlight? And if you said federalism, you are correct, because states basically get to decide how much they want to spend uh, on education. That is a state power, thanks to the 10th Amendment and federalism. All right, let's move on to Unit 2. When we talk about the branches of government, we have the House, we have the Senate. House is much more in touch with the people, right? There's more of them. Uh, they serve shorter terms. Know some of the major differences here was the Senate represents the entire state, um, and you're only made up of about 100 members. So you have fewer rules, there's more flexibility. Um, you know, a little bit easier in terms of a, being a little bit more intimate of a body compared to 435 people in the House. All right, pause this once again. What are some of the ex uh, exclusive powers of the House versus the Senate? And what are their joint enumerated powers? Take a moment. And in terms of enumerated powers, their, their joint powers, right, both the House and the Senate can declare war, they can uh, tax, um, they can regulate commerce, create money, as you see here together. But they also have what's called exclusive powers, where they are basically their power within Congress. So the House, all revenue bills have to start there, uh, particularly with the Ways and Means Committee. We also have a Rules Committee that is unique to the House, whereas the Senate, we have Foreign Affairs, where they are superior in Judiciary uh, Confirmations with respect to the Judiciary Committee, as well as the Foreign Relations Committee. Where we do see these two come together is when bills are reconciled with respect to the passage of a bill becoming a law. Now, a really key uh, component of the House elections in any state that has more than uh, one representative is gerrymandering. So every 10 years, we have the census. States are required to redistrict, create new districts, and reapportion based on population. So the party in power at the state level, that's really important, the state level, designs these laws, or these lines rather, uh, to favor the, their political party. So if Democrats are in charge, then they're going to do it. If Republicans are in charge, they're going to draw the lines favorable for them. And two of our cases do touch on gerrymandering, Baker v. Carr, one man, one vote. You cannot have different districts being different in terms of population. That's called malapportionment. What's also important about this case is it makes it justiciable, meaning that the courts can actually rule on this matter. Prior to this, this was seen as more of a legislative matter and not a judicial matter. We also have another case, Shaw v. Reno, where they tried to pack in their first African-American uh, district to have their first African-American uh, legislature at the House level. This was also seen as a violation of the 14th Amendment, um, and as a result, that did not go forth. Now, with respect to presidential powers, we have some formal powers, not impressive like Congress in Article 1, but you do have some important powers here enumerated. But do note, since the time of FDR, those have strengthened significantly, and they continue to be. So again, keep in mind, uh, bully pulpit, the use of the media, establishing cabinets, uh, you have a lot of informal powers, but make sure you do not equate an executive order as a formal power, as that is indeed an informal power. With respect to the judiciary in Article 3, that is not very well spelled out. Uh, we do have lifetime appointments, but the real power comes from Marbury v. Madison with judicial review, the power to declare a law unconstitutional. Now, one of the main concerns is should the courts restrain themselves and basically make their rulings based on the original founding thoughts of the father, founding fathers, uh, or should they be more activists, more involved, go beyond their duty of just declaring a law constitutional or not? And that is what we refer to as judicial activism. Keep in mind some important vocab here. Rule of four, you need four justices to hear a case. And once you have four cases, uh, four justices agree to that, you're going to issue a writ of cert. Now, this is supposed to make the, the branch as it has lifetime appointments as the least political, but some say, mm, perhaps not so much because again, you are first appointed based on your ideology. That's the number one criterion. Now, in terms of the bureaucracy, which will lump under the executive branch, there are four different types. So you have your 15 cabinet departments here, for example, the Department of Justice, Department of State, etc. Then you have agencies that don't fall anywhere. These are sort of the misfits, if you will, and these are called independent executive agencies. And then you also have what are called independent regulatory commissions. They are responsible for regulating, setting laws and rules over one sector of the economy. So, for example, the FAA dealing with airline the airline industry sets rules, and they are the judges of this. They create the rules, so they have a lot of power. And note this word here, independent, okay? And then we have government corporations. So this is where the government basically is in charge of 
a specific industry, um, such as mail and postal service, and you pay to use that. So if you paid for a stamp on an envelope, you are contributing to a government corporation. With the bureaucracy, the people who get the jobs oftentimes have to, you know, know something. It's the merit system. And they oftentimes have technical expertise. They are smart. They usually have educated backgrounds here. And they have a lot of discretionary authority in making a lot of choices. And this is, depends on how skillful the agency is. If it's something that's more technical, they get a little bit more authority in that regard. And there tends to be a lot of loyalty to that department from the employees, more than they, they, they would give uh, to the president. All right. All right. Pause this for a moment and see if you can name the checks on this branch. Pause it for a second on all these branches. And here you see them. And it's really important to know these checks. Um, I often like to joke that this is a glorified checks and balance quiz, but really, I mean, you need to know these. Now, in terms of the checks on the bureaucracy, you see some from Congress here, especially with legislation, appropriations, the courts, always judicial review, even interest groups here, even though they're not a branch. But of course, the executive branch plays a big role, even in appointments um, as well. All right. So when we get into unit three now, remember that this only applies to the national government, not the states. Um, and it's through selection collective incorporation in which you're going to have each aspect of the Bill of Rights being nationalized one by one. And this is done under the 14th Amendment. Uh, so when we're dealing with civil liberties, we're dealing with selective incorporation. Uh, when we're dealing with the, the Equal Protection Clause, we're dealing more with civil rights cases. Know some of these First Amendment cases. These are the foundational ones. And try to compare and contrast them. That often is a great method of better understanding how these cases were selected. And again, you have some other fundamental ones here. As I've noted before, Roe v. Wade is not on the exam. The thing I will mention with the Fourth Amendment is that when we're talking about the digital age protections here and what should be the scope of the federal government in terms of national security, and that's an ongoing debate here. We also have the exclusionary rule, which um, if the police acquire evidence illegally, that cannot be used against you. And then, of course, with the Eighth Amendment, there are certain populations that cannot receive the death penalty. That's really the extent that you really need to know. In terms of civil rights, be very familiar uh, with these two pieces of legislation. Of course, letter from a Birmingham jail. I always see that the hallmark you know, concept here is civil disobedience. And then, of course, with Title IX, uh, with respect to equal funding for women in sports. All right, take a moment, pause your screens right now, and see if you know the answer to this question. All right, and if you said B, you are correct. All right, let's go into Unit 4 now. Political socialization, know that the family is the number one influencer. Um, also be familiar with polls in terms of credibility. Sample size is huge in terms of random sampling. Sample size only needs to be about 1,000 to 2,000 if you are truly engaging in random sampling. Neutral questions as well, that's also important. Be familiar, too, about what each side is going to believe in terms of left versus right versus libertarians. Uh, our Democrats are known as the party that represents the leftist ideology versus the right. Conservatives with respect to Republicans. Again, keep that in mind. Pause as needed. In terms of fiscal policy, we're talking about how we raise money versus how we spend it. And there are two different philosophies with Keynesian. That starts under FDR, and that is really that government should be taxing and uh, being much more involved in the economy, where as supply side is more favored by conservatives and let the market do its thing. In terms of budgeting, mandatory versus discretionary, there's not a lot of uh, room for discretionary to spend on a lot of other things outside of Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security. They really uh, are the bulk of the budget. And then we have what are called means test programs where you have to qualify for it. So you have to be under a certain uh, income level, for example. We also have monetary policy. This is set by the Fed. They are independent and they determine the interest rates and the amount of money in circulation. So keep that in mind, monetary versus fiscal policy. All right, take a moment to pause this, see if you are able to get this correct. All right, and if you said choice B, you are correct. All right, let's move on to unit five here. Voting is highest during presidential elections. There are a lot of barriers today, registration ID laws. We also had the motor voter law, which it did increase the registration. However, it is uh, debated as to whether or not that actually increases turnout. Political parties, some of the major um, examples and uh, functions here, be familiar with them. Uh, third parties still play a big role. Think about a B, how it stings you. It raises important issues, but then the B dies after stinging the two major parties, especially after it adopts it. Here is your interest group um, use uh, in terms of functions, amicus curiae briefs, uh, use of litigation in the courts, but the size of it and how effective it is ultimately comes down to money and resources. In terms in terms of elections, we're talking about election, electoral college for the presidency. We have open versus closed versus blanket primaries. Uh, be familiar with those. More expensive for presidential uh, elections 
do know about Citizens United that opens up the floodgates for money. Here are some of the functions of the media. Be familiar with those. Take a moment to pause. And if you said C, you are correct. All right, so good luck on the exam, and I hope that this review was helpful. Thank you.